Flamingos at Miami Racetrack, the 400 of Britain's leading harriers get down to lap one of a grueling 10 mile test in the English Senior Cross Country Championships at Leamington Spa. And just to get him into the right spirit, the course begins with a nice long uphill pull. But they can take it over the grass on winged feet. That is, all but one Flatfoot Freddy, the happy harrier, and Stu Gentry. The wings fell off his feet. But he's game battling on where the pounding feet drum the tune of the turf. Up and down big hills with not much time to look at the scenery and an occasional five-bar gate to mark the miles. No, not that way, Freddy. Not that way. You see, it opens. At the end of the first of the three laps, the pace begins to tell, and you feel as if you've got a lump of lead in your shoes. The hills were beginning to get them, too. And at this point, the real fight started. A long, tough pull, with every new mile looking like three. By this time, Flatfoot Freddy is beginning to feel like Napoleon on the retreat from Moscow. Perhaps they should have marked the course out better. It started with a hopeful 400. Now there's only the stairs left. Now's the time for the last long pull to the wing post. Taking a good long pull of his own comes Freddy. But it'll take more than the windmill to put wind in his sail. Leading the field is Jack Holden, number 341, 39-year-old Tipton Harrier, coming in in great style to score his third championship win, 10 miles in 57 minutes. But down the course, there's the man with the happy feet. Arriving by flying boat at Karachi, the British parliamentary delegation to India is faced with a hectic program for its six weeks tour. Leading the delegates, Professor Richards comes ashore with some of his colleagues. One of their first calls was at Peshawar, capital of the northwest frontier province and the home of the Pathan fighting man. Doing the job properly, the members visited neighboring villages and through interpreters encouraged the people to explain their problems, which they most certainly did. Further north to the Khyber Valley, where the members look across into the mountain fortress of Afghanistan. With the launching of the Congress Party campaign, the delegation have their first glimpse of electioneering in a country whose future will soon be determined. Meanwhile, the celebration of the Aga Khan's Diamond Jubilee is Bombay's most colorful event for many years. The spiritual leader of two million subjects is shown the preparations for weighing him in diamonds. Their full value will be distributed for the needs of his people, a symbol of generous thought by a good friend of both East and West. Introducing the Miles Avenger, a new British two-seater soon to take part in our export drive for civil play. Taking off for Johannesburg, the Avenger will soon demonstrate Introducing the Miles Avenger, a new British two-seater, soon to take part in our export drive for civil play. Taking off for Johannesburg, the Avenger will soon demonstrate its new challenge to world markets. In her wartime assignment as a Thames flagship, London's famous Royal Eagle paddle steamer went all through the war and came out with a kill of five enemy aircraft and five doodlebugs. Now she's getting ready again with a lick of paint 
and all the busy paraphernalia that crops up when a grand old ship gets demobbed. A woman electrician gives a feminine touch, and the corking hammer makes the seams as sound as they used to be on the old peacetime jaunts between London Bridge, Margate and Clacton. Getting the wheel turning again is Royal Eagle's much decorated second engineer. Well, we promised to bring the Royal Eagle safely back from the war, and here she is, undergoing a refit now, so she'll be ready to take all the plows down London River without whistling. At Portland, ships of the home fleet are seen queuing up for the first spring cruise since the war. And no wonder there's a queue, because some of the ships are eventually bound for the sunshine of the West Indies. Escorting destroyers were first to leave, Ming, Zest, Zephyr, Zambezi and Zenith. Ships of the 10th Cruiser Squadron included the Birmingham, which was followed by the Diadem. These two cruisers, together with the Bologna, which joined the fleet at sea, are the ships going to Trinidad, Barbados. The first objective, so to speak, was Gibraltar. And I don't suppose a view of the fleet will do Franco any harm if he happens to look that way. Admiral Sir Edward Seyfried was in command, flying his flag in HMS Nelson. This famous battleship typifies the unceasing work of the Royal Navy, which from the first day of war to the last, fought unceasingly against every hazard the enemy could devise. The Nelson came through, and now she steams out on what we might call a victory cruise. The object of the cruise is described as transitional training, with radio and radar countermeasures as priority items. As we all know, the efficiency of the Royal Navy is still one of the most powerful factors in our security. of the American loan almost at hand, President Truman receives from the Director of War Mobilization and Reconversion a resolution on behalf of many American interests that the loan should go through. With this loan, Britain will be able and has agreed to abolish barriers that block our mutual trade. The alternative to the British loan is trade warfare between nations. Peace can be built only on a foundation of world economic cooperation and stability. The British loan is a cornerstone in the world's structure of peace. Continuing his triumphal American journeys, Mr. Churchill, accompanied by General Eisenhower, visits the old colonial town of Richmond, Virginia. The 18th century atmosphere seemed to appeal to Mr. Churchill, who was in sparkling mood as he gave the V sign to crowds of admirers. Among the many ancient buildings visited by the party was the Raleigh Tavern at Williamsburg, with many historic associations. Another relic of colonial days, the William and Mary College, still bearing the royal coat of arms. Once again, the crowds applauded the two war leaders as they came out to their waiting church. But here, some trouble started as the cameramen's flash bulb panicked the horses who began to plunge and rear. Amid the confusion, no one was calmer than Mr. Churchill, but everyone breathed a trifle more freely when he and the general decided that there was nothing like walking. Tribute is paid to a great soldier by two of Britain's frontline towns, Dover and Hastings, who confer their freedom upon Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery. At Dover College, cadets of all three services parade for inspection. During Monty's speech, the youngsters have what will probably be their only experience of being apologized to by a field marshal. Now, I'm, the only thing I'm sorry about is that we were a little bit late here. 
We got the mayor down the road. I, mean, I, I was all right. The mayor was a bit late. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I expect you got a bit cold. You got a bit cold waiting, and I'm very, very sorry about it. And anything we could do to warm her up, I would gladly do. Have they been to march the way? Yes, sir. We'll march up. March up. And with those marching orders, the parade proceeds to warm up in no uncertain manner. Hastings gave another big welcome to an old friend who chatted with ex-servicemen and recalled old times and old battles. Over at the other side of the town, Field Marshal got a very special greeting from Hastings' fisherman as he prepares to climb aboard the lifeboat. And after what he tells them, well, he just couldn't be more popular. And I've been up in the other part, the other part of the town, and they said, you wait till after lunch and you'll go to the proper part of the town. <laughs> and, here... and here's how Monty became a member of the fisherman's own exclusive Winkle Club. Well, this emblem that we're going to present to Monty, I'm going to call him, the same as he's known, is one of the most delicious things that comes from the bottom of the sea. That's a winkle. <laughs> and Monty is one of the most delicious men that was on the earth. <laughs> 